Hey, how's it going, everybody? Welcome to episode 223 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. My name is Jeremy. I'm your host, but guess what? I'm not actually the host for this episode. This episode is a little fun, a little different. It is a rebroadcast of a Martial Thoughts episode that came out a few weeks ago. See, if you listen to the show, you know that there are other martial arts podcasts, and not only am I a fan of a number of them, I've become friends with some of the hosts. So on this episode, I jumped over to Martial Thoughts with Sensei Jared Wilson, and we hung out. We talked about a subject that he actually came to me about as a result of episode 200. We had a chat during episode 200 about keeping teens in the martial arts and how I feel that that's kind of a, a linchpin, that if you can solve that as a martial arts school owner, that a lot of good things come from that. And he wanted to discuss that. So we got together, had a chat about it on his show, and it went really well. And of course, I asked his permission. He said, by all means, share it out on your podcast. So that's what we're doing here today. We are sharing episode, I believe it was 69 of Martial Thoughts as episode 223 of Martial Arts Radio, because that's what happens when podcast hosts get together. They chat and they share stuff. Now, if you haven't checked out other episodes of Martial Thoughts, you should. It's a great show. They do things differently over there. Not better, not worse, just different. And just as there are different martial arts styles, there are different martial arts podcasts, and they all have value. Maybe you'll find that you prefer Martial Thoughts to Martial Arts Radio. And you know what? That's fine by me. As long as you're training, as long as you're getting some entertainment and feeling solid in the martial arts community that a number of us are building here on the internet, it doesn't matter to me. I'll stop talking now. I'll turn it over to Sensei Wilson. And here we go. back to Martial Thoughts Podcast with episode 69, Make Podcasts Great Again. It's a great slogan. Maybe you should make that on a hat. Maybe a red one. I'm your host as always, Jared Wilson. And uh, before we get to our actual interview here, I've got one thing I'm going to ask for. And I don't ask very much. Uh, just looking for a little bit of help with iTunes reviews. I know there's a bunch of people listening. Um... There, you know, if you look at the download numbers, it seems to average somewhere about five to seven hundred, somewhere in that range. Uh, you know, bigger episodes with bigger stars, stars, bigger name people, I guess. People have their own martial arts following, tend to have bigger uh, downloads on my interview website here. But what I'm asking for is just put up a review. The more reviews there are, the more iTunes kind of pushes us to the front of the line, that type of thing. Not that I'm trying to get, you know, Martial Thoughts should be the number one podcast in martial arts or anything like that. But the more we have it out, the more it gets into other people's ears. And that can be another thing. If you have martial arts friends, because I'm kind of assuming you do when if you're listening to this. I'm, I mean, I know there's one or two people have emailed me and said, I'm not a martial artist, but... And then they listen to the show. So first thing is... Make sure people know that there are martial arts podcasts. If you're listening to this and you're enjoying it, which I'm assuming you are because it's episode 69 and you've gotten this far, share it with someone. There's a little button on the uh, on the iTunes website when you go and write your review. There's a little button that says share. And it you can type in people's names. You can share it on Facebook, that type of thing. Just let people know that there are martial thoughts podcasts. Or martial arts podcast. Not besides martial thoughts. No, no, don't let them know the other ones. Just let them know about martial thoughts. No, let them know that there are martial arts podcasts. We've talked to a number of people that have their own martial arts podcasts. Today we're talking to Jeremy Lesniak, who does the martial arts radio. We've talked to Paul Wilson from Karate Cafe. Uh, we talked to Sensei Ando from Fight for a Happy Life. We've talked to Jeff Westfall from The Martial Brain. Uh, way back in episode five... We talked to, I think it was episode five, we talked to Dave Jones from Haya. We talked to Craig Kiesling in there somewhere. We've talked to Lawrence Kane and Chris Wilder, who have Martial Thoughts podcasts. We even have Ian Abernathy on here. 
uh, which was a, a, a steal for getting them from across the uh, across the pond, so to speak. So there's a lot of martial arts podcasts. Let other martial artists know that they exist. That way we can kind of make the genre bigger. Because uh, we all know, except for, you know, Black Belt, there aren't really martial arts magazines. There isn't a good way for martial artists to communicate, especially cross-genre martial artists. <laughs> and in, if you haven't figured out by now, uh, genre is not as big a deal to me. Uh, we've talked to martial artists from just, well, I shouldn't say just about everyone, but from a huge cross spectrum, I'll put it that way, even to the point of, you know, from one inside, we've got uh, Tai Chi Chuan people, we've got Northern Shaolin Kung Fu, we've had MMA people on here, we've had a couple of Aikido people, just because that's my specialty, uh, we've had authors who write about Silat, we've had authors who write about Taekwondo, we've had all sorts of people who talk about all sorts of different things. So somewhere in there, your martial arts friends are going to find something they like. So go ahead and share that with them. Write a review on there. Listen to other martial arts podcasts because it's one big martial arts podcast family. And that's it. <laughs> that's my pitch for trying to make the world a better place for through martial arts. What we've got for today isn't really an interview. Uh, I've got Jeremy Lesniak back on with us. And we're going to talk about teenagers in martial arts. Or specifically the lack of teenagers in martial arts. They seem to disappear. They drop out of the system. And there seems to be this age gulf. I, I don't remember exactly what we said on the show, but I'm going to say somewhere about age 13 to about age 24, 25, that age group is missing from most martial arts schools. If you're a martial artist, uh, martial arts school owner and, and you have that group, let us know how you do that. Is there something specific you do? Is it just you have a bunch of teens and they attract their teen friends or college friends or whatever it happens to be? Let us know. So Jeremy and I are going to talk about that. And then at the very end here, stick around for This Week in Martial Arts. Well, we're here with Jeremy Lesniak again, who's been a frequent name on our podcast. What we've got for today is a little bit different. This is kind of going back to our old discussion shows. On, on Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio's 200th episode, Jeremy made a, a quick reference to how there was a, a lack of teenagers in martial arts. And that idea kind of stuck in my craw. And if you haven't listened to that 200th episode, it's a nice marathon. Uh, it'll take you a couple of days of driving back and forth to work. So go for that, if nothing else. Kind of rambling, <laughs> some alcohol involved, but that's okay. We, we can take that. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is a little bit about why teenagers disappear from martial arts. Because that seems to me, that seems to be, for all the stuff we talk about, the side benefits of martial arts, that's where they could really benefit from it is in those teenage years. Because every adult that I know thinks about their teenage years and they kind of grimace and smile and laugh and go, yeah, that was pretty dumb on me there. So... We're going to talk a little bit about teenagers in the martial arts. So how are you doing today, Jeremy? I'm doing great. How are you? Thank you. Thanks for having me back, sharing my voice with, with your listeners. And hopefully, I think we talked about this, that you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a few weeks on, on your feed, and then we'll share this out with the martial arts radio group and you know, just kind of share what, what I'm hoping is going to be a good and helpful conversation with everybody. Yeah, in all, in all, if nothing else, we get to chat again. <laughs> well, in all fairness um, to the listener, this is a take two. Um, my equipment failed somehow, and I got the first five minutes of our conversation. My elbow must have hit a button, and uh, it didn't record the rest of it. So <laughs> we're going to do this again. So I'm uh, I'm not a hundred percent convinced that that you just thought I did poorly <laughs> and uh, didn't have the heart to tell me. You know, Jesus, this guy's this guy's supposed to be a pro, right? He just did did a 200th episode and, and and he just rambles and he's God. awful he just talks <laughs> all the time couldn't get word in i'm just going to delete this file and not tell him. that's what that's that's what i think happened. <laughs> which explains why i brought you back right <laughs> exactly exactly because you are a glutton for punishment you thought maybe another roll of the dice would work out better no um yeah so it came up on episode 200 just the whole notion that we have this kind of this inverted bell curve with martial arts attendance. You got you got the kids 
And as they get older, they seem to drop off somewhere 10, 11, 12. And some of them will start to come back in their later teen years, but usually it's not until mid-20s, even the later 20s, that we see martial arts take a, a strong hold on those age groups. And I've been traveling around a lot because of work and just visiting schools and seeing that it's not just the schools I attend or the schools that I grew up in, but pretty much all of them. It's a school that has a strong teen program tends to have a stronger youth program and a stronger adult program. Yeah, I think it's a pretty universal thing. It's not like it's, you know, whatever, Aikido schools where, you know, it disappears. I think it's a universal to all the martial arts. And so the question becomes why? Why why is that the case? And, you know, I, I've got some ideas. We talked about some ideas on the on the 200th episode, and we talked about some ideas, you know, when you and I talked before. But I think it's important to figure it out because I think a lot of people would look at this and just say, you know, Teenagers are busy, teenagers are bored, teenagers are whatever else. But to me, solving the, the let's call it the teens in martial arts problem is actually a solution towards making martial arts overall bigger because it gives people a more linear path through, you know, people that, that do, let's say, dance as a, a kid or soccer as, as a kid. They've got a much further path up, right? Like they don't have to stop. But this kind of self-imposed detour that, I mean, I would say 90, 95% of teenagers take. Would you, would you agree with that number? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's probably about right. It, it's, it's pretty huge. It's dramatic. Yeah, one in 10 stays. So that's probably about right. Yeah, I would assume okay. something like that. So if, if, we, if we look at that trend, if we can correct it, then... Overall, we, we fix a few things, I think. I think, obviously, it's more people in the martial arts, and, and that's good. I mean, I know you think that. I think that. I'm going to guess pretty much anyone listening to this would think that. But what starts to happen when the majority of adult martial artists didn't take a break or had been training since youth? All of a sudden, we have that many more excellent practitioners and passionate people and secondarily, and this is the piece that I as a business person am most interested in, that's a demographic where people start to set their buying habits, where they start to look at having disposable income and spending it on things. And if we get them spending that on martial arts related stuff, we grow the martial arts economy. Well, well let me ask you one question, just because I, I don't have experience with any of the, the tournament scene. Is there that same golf at tournaments too? Uh, it, it's by numbers it in the tournaments that I attend, you mm -hmm. know, and there, there are different circuits and people do tournaments a little bit differently, but rather than the, that inverted bell curve, it's just a downward slope. Okay. Most of your tournament competitors are young. You know, I would say the, the initial peak is probably eight, nine years old and it starts to slide there. And there, there may be a little bit of a bump between, you know, 15, 16, 17, and then once you hit adult age. But I think some of that is because of just the, the way age groups are bracketed. It tends to be 16 and 17 year olds in one group and then 18 to 34, 18 to 39. So just you're, you're pulling from a larger age pool. So I think it looks bigger, but I bet if you were to restrict it to two, three year groups as they do with the kids mm -hmm. you would see it be even smaller well, well some of that i think is the adults probably just don't value the i don't want to say value the competition they don't that's not their goal anymore so that could be part of why the adults aren't in it too but i i think the major problem and, and maybe this is another conversation that we we have at some point you just kind of sparked my uh almost the rantier side of of <laughs> jeremy for those of you that, that may have heard that before uh, just, I think a, a lot of adults, especially adults that actually have reached black belt, are afraid of putting themselves out there in a, a way where they will be evaluated and possibly criticized. Sure. But anyway. So that's a, that's a whole separate subject. We're not going into that ball lax today for sure. No, that, that's a good discussion for another time, though. Okay. Um, well, well, let's look at kind of the why first. 
Um, and this isn't intended to be an interview. This is more kind of intended to be a discussion. But one of the problems, I think, at least in America, and I can't speak for the rest of the world, is we tend to view martial arts as something kids do. Meaning that we, we view it as an, you know, an after-school activity, like, like you said, soccer or dance or something like that. And so that when teens are starting to get out of that kid phase and starting to decide, well, what is it that I really want to do? What is it that I really like? That mindset comes to play in, that they think it's a, a, a kid's activity. I mean, I, I'm sure you do the same thing. You, you know, it comes up somehow that you're in martial arts, and they go, oh, I used to do karate. And you're like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what's up with that used to, right? And I think a lot of that is that we tout certain benefits of martial arts, but not martial arts as a lifestyle. We have, I, I, you know, I'm 38, so I I can't say what it was like in the 50s, 60s, and, and 70s. But I know that since I've been involved in martial arts, and I joined when I was very, very young, martial arts has has always been a thing that some people did and dedicated their lives to, but very rarely was it a all encompassing pursuit for people, at least as an option. And, and that's a a whole, um, you know, we could go pretty deep on that because it's, it's that gap that is, is my, uh, biggest interest as it comes to whistle kick and and trying to provide people with resources and, and, products and things that allow them to manifest martial arts into their entire life. Well, I think that's actually one of the reasons people come back to it later, too, is they once you're out of college and you start having to try to actually identify who and what you are, you start looking for something like that. And martial arts happens to fit that, that bill pretty well. Right. And I think people do that, but without a lot of conscious effort. I don't think people are looking around saying, you <laughs> no, know, no, no, it's not, gee, what do I, I want to base my life on? Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. I think it's almost process of elimination. Mm-hmm. Martial arts is always there. It's always been there. It will always be there. And if you trained, hopefully you have positive memories being akin saying, you know, I really did enjoy that. And once you come out of college, if, if you choose to go to college and especially once you've kind of move through your 20s and and your life is work and you know maybe you you go to a gym or you hike you have a couple hobbies it's hard to meet people it's hard to meet people in in just a a platonic friendly you know build my social circles circle sense and martial arts is one of those few places where it's not necessarily easy but easily in a social acceptable socially acceptable way you know i can go to pretty much any town or city in this country and join a martial arts school and instantly have a bunch of people that might become my friends. Or at the very least have the same interests as you. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we spend a few hours a week doing something together and similar and building some bonds and, you know, I can go home after that and not feel like my entire life is is either alone or at work. You know, I've got something that I'm part of a group. Which, which, again, getting back to our subject, would make it think that that's exactly what a teenager would want. Right. Uh, and I think that... Go ahead. I was going to say, and, and that kind of builds up to the idea of, you know, we said that, you know, martial arts is a kid's activity, but I think when teenagers are starting to try and figure out their own independence, suddenly they want to go and shop around a little bit of activities. They want to do things that are more group-oriented. And... For lack of a better term, martial arts is pretty solo oriented. I mean, you know, it's not a team sport, so to speak. Right. Now, I would say it's not so much that they're looking to be part of the team, but I think they're looking for acceptance. Mm -hmm. I I think, and, you know, I I work with kids, and I know you work with kids, uh, actually, much more than I do. But when kids start going through those adolescent years, they're going to do anything they can to feel accepted by the people they identify as not only their peers, but those they want to be their peers. Mm -hmm. And of course, that leads to all kinds of mistakes and and people doing the wrong thing. I mean, we we all, you know, most of us were teenagers or maybe we have some teenagers listening. I I don't know how many people we have listening preteen, but everyone is going to be a teenager or was a teenager and 
most of us remember that struggle of trying to fit in. I mean, that's really where it it coalesces the most, wouldn't you th- say? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, let's face it, teenage years are rough in general. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're physically changing, you're mentally changing, um, you start to get some independence, but everyone's still trying to rein it in. So, I mean, it's a constant struggle being a teenager. (laughs) Without a doubt. So there we are, you know, we're teenagers and we're trying to, to do things that fit in and we maybe have some parents, which I mean, by the time you're a teenager, you don't want to do anything like your parents or anybody else's parents. We have a complete void because it, it just it's self perpetuating of few teenagers involved in martial arts. And if your martial arts school was like mine growing up, the people the the teenagers that were doing martial arts were some of the bigger nerds in the school. And I'm raising my hand right now, even though this is an audio show. <laughs> and then who is left? You got little kids. So you've you've got someone who by definition is trying to separate themselves from what little kids do, they have no peers to, rel- to to lean on to say this is something people my age do. And further, where are the larger-than-life role models? With professional sports, we have them. With entertainment, we have them. All the things that tend to attract teenagers have those larger-than-life role models. And the people that we hold up as role models are older. People that were role models when... You and I were teenagers, somebody like, you know, Bill Wallace or, you know, Bruce Lee's passed on, but he's still kind of the, the icon of martial arts. Yeah, I half jokingly call him St. Bruce, the patron saint of martial artists. Yeah, I, I don't even know that that deserves half half of a joke because it's <laughs> true. He's still the most influential martial artist on the planet, despite the fact he's been gone 40, 40 50 years plus now? years. Yeah. yeah. I think besides, you know, some of the stuff you're mentioning, I think some of it's almost a rebellion because they were in it as teenagers, or sorry, as, as children, their parents put them in. So maybe because it's mom and dad and family are doing it, suddenly that can't be cool anymore. I'm sure there's some of that. But when I look at the kids that are playing basketball or soccer or baseball or, you know, I, I live in Vermont and hockey is really big here. Mm-hmm. A lot of those kids have been playing hockey since they were the same age that little kids would might start martial arts. And sure, there's going to be some rebellion, but it's not nearly at the same numbers. Yeah, I, I can see that with the other sports. And I think you might be right in that for some reason we've socially accepted the, the sports, basketball, football, hockey, whatever it happens to be. Um, as a bigger activity that you can do than martial arts. And maybe it's right. Maybe it's because there's just not as, a, as much exposure to it. There's not the celebrity endorsement of it. Um, I mean, I, we both know. Nobody gets rich in martial arts. <laughs> so it, it's hard to hold up, you know, the lifestyle of martial arts of the rich and famous, you know. <laughs> I, I think it's a validation issue. It, it, goes, it goes to money. It goes to... Uh, TV time, mm-hmm. movies, you know, when we look at movies, yeah, we, we see some great people doing some great things and, and some of them are paid very well for doing that. But we see very little martial arts as non-fantasy. You know, we see very little martial arts competition. We see very little martial arts um, instruction creep in you know people on sitcoms play basketball or they play soccer or they play on a softball league if someone is a martial arts student within the the context of a of a bigger role on a tv show be it comedy or drama they're making light of it they don't feature the positive stuff at on it and when was the last time we get to see we, we got to see martial arts on TV? We barely see the Olympic stuff. The U.S. Open is on ESPN two. You know, it's funny. I was just trying to watch that this Friday, and it was supposed to be on at whatever it was six or seven, like prime time. And I'm like, holy crap! So of course I tried to watch it, and it was preempted and shown at two a.m. <laughs> right, right. And then, as you're saying, nobody gets rich doing martial arts, so. 
if you're if you're a kid and you're starting to look at what seems to drive the world, not that any 11, 12 year old is going to be able to articulate this, but you're looking around, you're seeing, OK, LeBron James is famous and he makes a lot of money for playing basketball and he's great at what he does. And people wear his jersey and they put posters of, of him in their in their room and he's on TV and he's on TV, not just playing, but people want to hear what he has to say. And he's sponsor. He's sponsored by, uh, you know, soft drinks and things. There's a lot of validation there. And you look at other sports, you look at entertainment. That's all there. That is not there for martial arts. And until it is, teenagers won't want to do it. Which may be where the UFC actually succeeds. Um, they have all those things. I mean, UFC champions are essentially household names. Yeah. Yeah, and we've seen some good stuff there. Um, the challenge is we've seen how fleeting those careers can be. No, I'd be curious to see, I, and I have no idea, you know, statistics to back this up, but I wonder if the MMA gyms, because I don't know what else you want to call them, uh, don't have that slump or, you know, because they don't start as young, maybe their their bell curve, you know, starts much steeper in teenage years. So maybe they've actually solved that problem that way. There are youths and there are teens involved in MMA gyms, and I don't have the hard numbers, <clears throat> but I know that there is a strong parental resistance. Yeah. Because even if it's not full contact, even if they're not going to be competing and jumping in a cage. Just saying MMA is going to make a lot of parents really nervous. Which is funny because, you know, you're talking about hockey or football. I mean, those are pretty freaking dangerous sports, too. They are. And and both of those sports, you know, um, the, the the children that get involved in, in them, you know, yeah, there, there's certainly some parental resistance. And not every kid that wants to play football is going to be able to play football. Because their their parents don't want them to, you know. There's 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 more and more science coming out around concussions, and and that's just going right. to continue to to hold that back. But well, and maybe that's it. Maybe the UFC actually is doing a good job of putting forth names and heroes, so to speak. Um, and I hate to say it this way, but the rest of the martial arts world might just be too fractured to be able to do that, to where we all agree, these guys rock. These are the awesome guys. I don't know. I, I, they're definitely doing a better job. You know, the if, if we consider MMA a, a flavor of martial arts, then we could also consider Olympic Taekwondo a flavor. We could consider mm -hmm. uh, your kind of WKF, you know, your traditional Japanese karate competitions you know as another flavor and they all have their celebrities the the nasca circuit in the united states has you know the has celebrities within it but the the money isn't there right people follow the money the the best people in the world end up doing things at a high level when there are high dollars sure if you're a tremendously talented athlete and you could do martial arts or you could play basketball or you could do any number of things. And your your peak as a martial arts competitor with sponsorships and everything might be that you make a hundred grand in a year <laughs> as the best in the world. Eh, you're probably not going down that route when the lowest paid player in the NFL is making, I want to say it's like, 200 and something for being on the practice squad. Yeah, I think if you're on the team, it's 300 and, well, last time I checked, it was like 340,000, which is about three times the best in the world in martial arts to make. Right. Now, of course, there are some school owners and everything that make more money, and they make great money, and they deserve to make that because they're wonderful business people. But nobody that's 12 years old looks around and says, <laughs> I want to be like that guy running this business, working 70 hours a week. No, they, they want to be like these larger-than-life characters. They, they want to have personality. They, they respond to that charisma. And within martial arts, we tend to not... We, we don't... What's the word I'm looking for? We don't tend to value that strong individual passion because we're most of us 
are steeped in tradition. And and outside of the, the school, maybe that's a good thing. Anybody that has been in a class with me, I mean, if it's if it's at all acceptable, I mean, I'm, I'm cracking jokes, especially if I'm teaching, I'm cracking jokes. People are laughing while they're training. You know, they're, they're, my personality doesn't shut off when I, when I bow into the dojo floor. It, you know, you're talking about that. It, in a lot of dojos, you're talking about the tradi- tradition. And money is almost seen as a bad thing. You know, it, it's a shunned away thing. You know, there's even a debate of should real instructors charge their students, you know, type of thing. And then, okay, we're in America. We're going to charge for everything. But, <laughs> you know, that That's, aside. <laughs> um, you know what? That that Maybe there's another topic we could have. Maybe maybe we make this a regular thing because I call <laughs> flat out BS on that. That that is that's that's sour grapes right there. That that's could be. That could be. Does not either does not have the skills or the time or the desire to run the school at a at a in a profitable way. And if and if it's desire, that's fine. But if it's skill, you know, it's well, you know, real martial arts instructors don't charge. Well, you know what? fine that that's um i know some pretty amazing martial arts instructors it, that some some have big schools some have small schools but the ones that set out to try to do it for little to no money rarely do they last and how many lives are you affecting at that point you know that might actually be another reason why and getting back to the subject why the teenagers don't do it is they start to have just more financial burdens is a bad way to say it, but more financial uh, responsibilities. You know, they start having to pay for more of their own schooling stuff. They have to buy their own, they want to buy their own clothes, that type of thing. When you get to college, yeah, okay, college is notoriously a poorhouse. So suddenly something as superfluous as a martial arts class may not be the thing that makes the cut. So I wonder if you could have a, a college discount for martial arts schools. Uh, somehow offer a student discount. I've seen that. And when I reflect back on my time in college and, and I was part of a couple different martial arts clubs during those years, most of the people had already been training. We did have some that were like, Hey, I want to join in. I want, I want to learn. But most people that were in those clubs had already been training because college is an expensive time. And even if it's a student club, you know, you probably still want to buy a uniform at some point, uh, but you're busy. And I think that's yeah. it is people make people in college are looking for for new new things to do. Sure. But for the most part, people are wrapped up with sleep, school and and, you know, maybe a work study job. You know, there there isn't a ton of free time in there. And f- for very few people that have never done martial arts, will martial arts pop up as being, hey, this is a thing that just resonates with me so strongly. I have to try it now. And even if you're not in college in your early 20s, you're trying to get whatever it is you're doing going. So again, that right. time and money becomes a very high price commodity. Right. Right. So when we when we look at teenagers, when we look at what motivates them, it's I mean, I mean what we can we can put I I, I think it's three things. It's it's money because they see the power of money for the first time, really. Mm-hmm. It's sex because they're starting to see how they relate to the rest of the world. It, you know, the, in in terms of romantic relationships and, and how those are presented. And you see people in entertainment being shown in sexualized situations. And it, it's acceptance from their peers, you know, whether that's, you know, uh, you know, their guys and their their guy friends or girls, their girlfriends, you know, something wider like the the academic class at their school. Mm hmm. And in all of those cases, we're talking about people looking up to role models and where the martial arts role models. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, from a, a small place, like a school place, right? The sensei is supposed to be that person. Now, at the same time, they don't have all those qualities because, you know, that's not who a sensei is going to be. Yeah, they're they're not. No offense, they're not that sexy of a people most of the time. No, no, we and and, and that's actually something that's popped up on 
our show a couple times the idea that and 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 this is this is not me making a judgment this is me repeating maybe i'm hiding behind <laughs> behind repeating what some other some of the guests on the show have said about you know we talk about the physical benefits of martial arts and then some of our highest ranked most uh credible martial artists uh, <laughs> uh, 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 do not seem to have the physical prowess to implement their skill yeah, there's um, <laughs> you know, as the bar- belts get darker, the belly gets bigger. You know that type of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so if if we look at you know, and 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 if you're a school owner, if you're an instructor, and this is doesn't, if we're not describing you, then great. And if it is, if it does describe you, if you do feel like we're poking at you, it, it's not personal. Right. We're not naming names and I'm not thinking of anyone in particular. But if you're a 12 year old and you're seeing movie stars, musicians and professional athletes. And those are what media and your peers are telling you are your role models. The overweight. 57 year old martial arts instructor who. Makes it somewhat obvious that he is not successful financially that person's not going to be the one that the 12 year old looks to and says i want to be like this person when i grow up no that that, that's not the coolest person in the world right now does that happen sometimes yeah i you know i I remember looking up to my martial arts instructors even through my teen years but it wasn't because i looked at them and said i want to look like them or I want to act like them, or I want to have the financial success of them, I looked up to them because of the impact they had had on my life and the lives of others. And most, and I wanted, and most of the time, they're good character people, too. Yes. But that's not enough. No. And we can argue whether or not it should be this way, but I think that's irrelevant, because it is. And there's a lot of money and a lot of effort from some very smart people spent on making sure that it stays this way because this is the heart of marketing. So we talked a little bit about this, but how would we fix this? If you're an individual school owner or, or if you're looking at, you know, kind of like you are, but you know, martial arts as a, as a whole, as a generality, as a genre, so to speak, what do we do? How do we start putting up people that can be idolized by martial artists? Because I hate to say it this way, but martial arts are really, really fractitious. I mean, <laughs> you know, someone that's a Taekwondo hero um, means nothing to most Aikido ka, you know, that type of thing. Right. And that's part of the problem, I think. I think so. I, I, I think that it's really easy to to dismiss what happens in other martial arts because, unfortunately, you know, and, and I was at a, a weekend-long seminar in upstate New York with some some great friends and wonderful people and this event is is one of the best with respect to respecting other martial arts and I still ended up in a seminar with a guy who was picking on other martial arts certain martial arts competitions because of their rules and this and that to the point where I almost walked out <laughs> you know it really it irritated me or- he he was teaching a seminar. Wow. Okay. I ended up in his seminar and I'm just I'm looking at him and I'm thinking look around. <laughs> you have one of the lowest attendances of any of the seminars this session. And I think there's I, I think there's a there's something to be said there. I think, you know, when you put out negativity, you you get it back. But to answer, I mean, you know, we're we're kind of working through a lot of this together. How do we fix it? I think one of the things that needs to happen is that teenagers need to be given their own space in class. Right. You know, teenagers shouldn't be training with, with young kids and teenagers shouldn't all shouldn't only be te- training with adults. I think it was on I think it was on your 200th episode. You had the uh, uh, an idea I really liked that was cool. And it was for in the teenage class to have them basically like stage a fight scene. I think that was the one episode you were talking about that. Yeah. That, yeah, that's an awesome teenagers idea. learn differently. They want they want big. They want dramatic. They want excitement. It's you know they're they're at a time when they they still haven't quite shed the the goal of immediacy that young kids want. You know right? 
anybody that's had a kid or been around kids knows kids want what they want right now. Yep. You know, I, I want this now. I'm hungry now. I need to go to the bathroom now. <laughs> and teenagers still haven't quite developed the same patience that adults are going to have. And let's be honest, not every adult ever <laughs> develops patience. But what they have started to grasp is an adult view of how the world works. I was, I was teaching at a seminar uh, just about two months ago, uh, a weekend camp, and I ended up with this, this group of low-ranked young kids, like five, six, seven white and yellow belts. Mm. And it was just chaos. <laughs> yeah. And it was just certain kids in the group and just the dynamic, just chaos. But what I was able to do to, to rein them in is I convinced them I was a ninja. <laughs> I can't do that with teenagers. <laughs> I can't lie to them to get their attention. I have to demonstrate something that garners their respect. And then I need to give them a path towards something that they will respect the effort that went into it. So helping them construct their own choreographed fight sequence and then videoing it and putting it out on social media if they so choose. To show people, hey, not only did I do a thing, but it's kind of cool, and you could check it out too. Yeah, I think that's part of the problem is, you know, we, we've been talking about, you know, they want to be accepted as a, te uh, a peer group. They want to be accepted as, you know, non-peer groups. So in order to have teens in a martial arts school, you kind of have to have teens in a martial arts school. So <laughs> there's... The, the, you have to have them there to have a peer group of them. Yes. Now, one of the other things I, I would, if I was a martial arts school owner, one of the classes that I would host, I would have once a week, probably on a weekend, or depending on time of day, you know, may, maybe maybe a little bit later, like a seven o'clock class, mm -hmm. where teenagers can come in and it's done, not from the perspective of this is martial arts. You're coming in to learn martial arts. It's we're going to give you martial arts to help make you better at the sports that you play. Mm, okay. Not every instructor is going to have the skill set and, and the, the desire to construct a program like that. But if we're not going to get them in the door because they're looking for their place in life and martial arts is something that they think they want to do, how many, how many athletes out there, how many young athletes – are looking for an advantage. We have kids doing steroids in high school now. Yeah. You can't tell me that there isn't a desire to look for a leg up. But what if the things that we already know that society believes are good about martial arts, focus, discipline, flexibility, calisthenic strength, what if there's a martial arts program that helps make student athletes better at their other things? Are the majority of them going to stick around? No, but it's going to change the perception, and some of them will. Some of them will move from that class to the regular class during their off-season. You know, and I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head, but there's a, an NFL coach who, for lack of a better term, teaches kind of like basic Wing Chun skills to defensive linemen in the NFL. Yeah, I've seen I've seen that article. I don't remember the which team or, or the gentleman's name. Yeah, he's he skipped around a little bit from team to team, but it has to do with you know as the offensive lineman's hands are coming towards you, you know, slipping by them and getting by it, which is makes perfect sense from kind of a Wing Chun point of view, or an Aikido point of view. You know, if you want to make it the whole body movement type of thing, so I could see where that could work really easily. I think we can agree, and I'm going to guess anyone listening can agree. You can't show me any generally accepted martial art that won't have a positive impact for any external sport if someone dedicates a little bit of time. I think we all know that. But if the only way we're going to let people gain those benefits is to come in and deal with thousands of hours of basics and <laughs> meditation and other things that teenagers are never going to want to do, we're never going to have teenagers as a big chunk of our student base. And if you don't want to make those changes, that's fine. You don't have to. But when your competitor across town does, and all of a sudden the teenagers are going there, who do kids look up to? 
young kids. They look up to teenagers because they're more approachable. They, they see a, less of a gap between who they, who they are at age seven and who they are at age 12, 13, 15, you know? Mm-hmm. And especially in those multi-sibling families, the parents aren't going to want to bring the kids to, you know, two, three different martial arts schools. It's a way to get a leg up. I think that could be a great idea. The sports adjacent martial arts class. Yeah. I don't know what you would call yeah. it, but. And and we do specialized classes. I mean, how often have you seen a, a six week self defense course? Or even the, you know, the the kickboxing aerobic class, you know, that type of yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's still primarily martial arts, but we're cutting out pieces to appeal to the demographic. It's marketing. And we can do that for teenagers. We can do. There's a difference between the way you would teach an 11, 12 year old and the way you would teach a 17 year old. So you could even have different classes. You can split it. There's a lot of ways you can slice this. Here, I got a question for you, and, and it kind of ties in with that. Um, what about for, I guess for lack of a better term, the teen class that we're going to talk about here? What about no gi? Just come in, workout clothes. Do you think that? be beneficial or detrimental i think it depends on how you market it one of the things that i've heard you know i i I went to public schools and we didn't really have dress code not the way some public schools have dress code now Mm -hmm. but we certainly didn't have the dress code of a private school Mm -hmm. and one of the things i've heard even from teenagers that attend those schools we don't have to worry about what we wear and if people are getting picked on for it so uniform. So there's a there's a plus and a minus. You know the the right. the plus of letting people pick their own stuff. And this is a conversation that comes up in traditional martial arts all the time. You know, do I want to let my students individualize by wearing a red uniform, a blue uniform, a pink uniform? You know, do I want to let them put, um, you know, a patch from their from the the competition circuit they they compete on on their uniform, or do I put them in you know, everybody's got to wear white. It's got to be this style. It can go either way. I think one of the things is, and I'm kind of arguing both sides at the same time, is a lot of teenagers, because their bodies are changing, are not comfortable with the way their bodies look. So, and they're, they're I guess I want to say, it, they're trying to hide their body in a lot of way. So in yeah. some ways, having that gi could kind of blanch that out. Or, you know, if they're, <laughs> we've all seen that person that's worn that gi the very first time and it's straight out of the packaging, you know, it's nice square creases on the shoulder, that type of thing. Sure. And it may make them feel even more awkward for just for that first or second time. So I'm not quite sure well, if I, which way I would think on that one. And one of the things I've heard from school owners uh, as they reach out and they say, hey, can Whistle Kick's next product be this or this or this? Hmm. Uh, because people are always reaching out to me, you know, with their ideas. One of the things that the industry really wants are uniforms cut for bigger people. Hmm. Okay. Because we are at a time when 60% of our population is overweight. Not necessarily obese, but 60% is overweight. I want to say the figure on obesity is 30%. Yeah, that, that kind of rings true from what I remember. Okay. So we can do, a, you know, we, we can we can look at those numbers in, in certain ways, but Somewhere around one out of every three people that would be interested in martial arts is not going to feel terribly comfortable with a thing wrapped around their waist (laughs) that kind of showcases how big their waist is. Right. I'm not advocating the removal of belts, but I think that right there would kind of push me into, hey, if we have a, a, a teen martial arts skills rather than martial arts class okay yeah let them come in in street clothes or maybe you give them options maybe maybe it, the uniform isn't uh, a gi or a dobok maybe it's a school shirt mm-hmm. maybe it's uh you know board shorts you know there, there are a lot of different ways you could do that but they got to be camouflage <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 i mean <laughs> It's got to be it's got to be fun. It's got to be clothes that people want to wear. You know, if you're if if the T-shirt you're going to give them is a, you know, a five dollar 
box cut burlap sack with a one color logo on the front on the chest that that's not cool that's never going to be cool right well, you can you you can boil almost everything that teenagers want down to what's cool. Teenagers want to be cool. Well, that kind of brings the last part then up. We kind of talked on you know a couple of different pieces on it, but how do we make martial arts sexy then? <laughs> That's a tall order, I know. Um, right. And again, you can kind of look at it as two different ways. You can look at it as the individual, you know, dojo manager, or you look at it overall as how do we affect the industry, right? There, there's bigger stuff that has to happen in the industry, and and you know we're not going to talk about it on air because some of this is is, you know, competitive info that I'm not willing to put out publicly. You and I have talked about it a little bit. Right. There are things that at Whistle Kick I, I'm hell bent on doing, because I see this as one of the biggest pieces of the problem in growing martial arts globally, and and that's that's pretty much my single goal. I want to see more people doing martial arts, but if we look at it on a more individual level as a school owner, what can be done? You have to create the environment. If, if you don't have the opportunity to say, come do martial arts because this famous person does, you have to create an environment that speaks to the rest of what they want. They want to feel accepted. They want to be better at the other stuff they're doing in their lives, which, you know, maybe, maybe it's martial arts skills for sport. Maybe it's martial arts skills for academics. Maybe those are two different classes. Maybe the academics ones, you're pulling in the the nerds. Hey, I was the biggest nerd in my school. I get to say that. You're pulling in the nerds by teaching them meditation and focus and discipline, and they become better students out of it. How many martial arts school owners have have heard from their par- from kids' parents, my kid is a better student now because of martial arts? It happens all the time. Yeah. You know, we, we need to look at what's going to bring them in and we need to to let go of a lot of our preconceived notions about what is and is not martial arts because it's all martial arts. And it's better to have them there with a positive attitude towards what they're learning than to have them bail because they weren't keen on doing 100 reverse punches each class. I, I, there was a good saying that someone asked me, he says, well, what's the best martial art? And I, I answered him kind of unintentionally. I said, well, it's the one that you go to. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, because it is. It, it's that simple. You know, there might be a great martial art, and it might be the perfect martial art for you, but if it's on the other side of town and it's going to take an hour and a half with traffic to get there, you're not right. going to go. <laughs> right. Now, this is the type of thing that if Whistlekick did – programming and associations and things like that we would have already turned out a here's what we think a teen programming should look like in martial arts schools i'm not going to do that that's just that's not that's not what we do here no, but i do bet that market it to all the martial arts schools out there well maybe somebody else will. <laughs> but i don't think it has to be that complex because most martial arts schools are going to have a couple teenagers and you go to them and you say okay what would it take to get your friends to come in? Hmm. That could be a good question. Just ask them. <laughs> what, what would it take? And maybe you've got to set up your own uh, focus group. Maybe you've got to find an excuse. Hey, um, we're going to do you know, some kind of Friday night event. You know? And again, use the best resources you have, which are those few that you probably have that meet this demographic and set up something fun. Bring them in and say, all right, if you come in, we're going to feed you and maybe we'll take you all to the movies and we'll do X, Y, Z. And I want 15 minutes of your time to talk about martial arts. And oh, you can't phrase it like that. They're going to tune out. <laughs> but, but you see what I mean? I mean, yeah. you, you got you kind of have to hide it, but you got to get a conversation going and say, what, what would you come in here for? If, if maybe, you maybe you have the the right kind of students. Maybe they're students that have been around a while, and you know they they really get it. They're really sharp. And you say, okay, if you were to build a dojo, dojang school, whatever, exclusively for people your age, what would it look like? 
And I bet you they'll come back with some ideas that you never even thought of. You know, there might be a homework room. There might be uh, a game room. There might be a couch. <laughs> Something simple like that, sure. Maybe a bunch of cell phone chargers. Maybe there's a shower. Maybe maybe there's there's way different stuff on the walls. Maybe they're wearing different uniforms. Maybe classes aren't an hour. Maybe they're two. Maybe they're 30 minutes. I don't know. Right. I'm not a teenager anymore. I don't remember quite at that level what I would wa- would have wanted. And I may not have been the best example because I'd been doing martial arts for 10 years at that point. So you were one of the kids that actually kept going to it too. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm one of the first to admit I wanted out. My mother wouldn't let me. And I'm <laughs> glad she didn't. What, what age it, did you start to want to get out then? Just out of curiosity. Um, 14. Okay. Just curious. Right right about there. And it was because of the pull of other things. Because I was tired of, you know, I was competing. I was succeeding in competition. Um, I was tired of getting picked for it. Mm. Because it was seen as not cool. Again, it, it kind of seems to be that we think that martial arts is something kids do. Yeah. And I think some of that is the way we market martial arts. Yeah. And again, that is that is a broader problem. That's not one that you or I or even all of us on the, you know, everyone listening, if we were all to get in a room and hammer this out, we, we couldn't solve this. It's 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 entrenched and it's big. But you can affect what's going on in your town, in your area. Imagine what would happen if, if, if you, you know, if, if you're a martial artist and you're a really skilled martial artist and you're great with footwork, go be an assistant coach on the football team. Right. Go teach them footwork. And then that football coach, hey, I want you to urge your football players to come to my classes during the offseason. That could work. Might be seen as a money move, but oh no, you all of a sudden have more students. That's <laughs> terrible. That's horrible. Yeah. Yeah, we hate that. <laughs> well, I think we covered a lot on that one. We did. We did. And I honestly, I think this went better than last time. <laughs> I, th- I think I think we got better stuff. Yeah, take two definitely was better. <laughs> right. No, there probably will not be a take three. <laughs> Hopefully not. But maybe we'll revisit if people have some ideas, if they want to write in or. Yeah, if they want to write in, you know, something we forgot to say or something you do in your school and it seems to work. You know, hey, we don't have that gulf of, you know, teenagers disappearing. Let us know. Let Please. other people know. Yeah, let's let's get that shared out there because I think hopefully everyone can agree that if we can solve this, it leads to a lot of good stuff in a generation. Yeah, and it'll take a generation too. Yeah, this is not the immediate switch that you know you want as a teenager. No. <laughs> well, well, thank um, you. yeah. Thanks for coming on and talking about always, this. And always, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe we should have occasional conversations because I think we came up with three different topics just talking today we did we did man this is what happens when podcasters get together <laughs> people are talking they come much. up they come up with podcasts and then <laughs> ideas for future podcasts <laughs> so how was that did that give you some ideas for how to keep that age group in your martial arts classes? Did it make you realize that you didn't have them in your martial arts classes? Do you have something that you do to try and keep them in there? Is there something motivational that you think we forgot? Let us know. Uh, you can email me at martialthoughts at gmail.com or you can email Jeremy at jeremy at whistlekick.com. For this week in martial arts, we're going to go with August 15th, 1945 where the martial art of Defendo was named. Defendo kind of has a weird history. I was looking at some website, and honestly, I don't even remember where it was, and it had a list of martial arts by countries, and one of them was Canada. So I looked at it and went, all right, clicked on it. 
Defendo was developed by an interesting gentleman named Bill Underwood, who actually created it out of a system that he had before called Combato. Combato was a system that he developed from a mixture of a couple of different things. Boxing, kind of Western wrestling, and jiu-jitsu. And he taught it as a... I even say self-defense is a bad term for it. He taught it as a, a combat system to soldiers in World War II, to American and Canadian soldiers. After World War II, he, he was asked to keep teaching that at the U.S. Army Ranger School, at the FBI, and he decided that the system itself was too violent for a non-wartime situation. So he changed it, and kind of like they did with the Japanese, they took you know, the lethal techniques out and went from jiu-jitsu to judo or from aikijitsu to aikido. And he did that and realized he couldn't call it combato anymore. It was a different art. So his daughter actually came up with the name of defendo. So instead of combat, you're defending it. Kind of makes sense. Sounds funny, but, you know, it was 1945, so <laughs> we'll give him a little bit of a break for the naming. If you look at it, and I've, I, because I was curious about it, I went on YouTube and looked at it. It's a system that reminds me, my first thought is that it reminds me of Krav Maga. But then you can see the jiu-jitsu influence in there. And if you know the history of Krav Maga, that kind of makes sense that it would kind of end up looking similar. He initially published a book on it in 1950 called Defendo, Police Systems of Self-Defense. Which is interesting because he kind of developed it to be a, a used for law enforcement officers. Which, again, for 1945, 1950, that's a very unusual thing. Uh, and by 1969, there was enough, I guess, kind of martial arts knowledge that he published a book called Defendo, Occidental Systems of Self-Protection. Again, which is an interesting idea. I've never read the, either of these books, but I'm, I'm curious to see what they would look like. He, he seemed to be playing off the idea of Asian martial arts because they had made enough of an impact. People kind of at least people in maybe more combat situations, ex-military and the police or whatever it happened to have been, knew kind of what some of the martial arts from Asia looked like. So he created, or I should say, he developed his own system of how to teach it to law enforcement officers. Like I said, it's still being taught today, and you can find videos of it on YouTube. I'll probably have it on my show notes, which you can get to from uh, thinkingmarshall.blogspot.com. Uh, if you want to... Let me know about something. I already gave the email, but it's marshallthoughts at gmail.com. Leave an iTunes review for us. Go on to Facebook. Facebook is a pretty good way. It Everything I kind of put out, I generally put out on Facebook. If you want to get episode updates, if you're not subscribed to the show, if you just want to get the updates for it, you can do that. That's uh, facebook.com slash marshallthoughts. And then there's Twitter as well, which is just at marshallthoughts. So until next time, Keep thinking those martial thoughts.
I hope you enjoyed that. I really enjoyed the episode. In fact, I enjoyed doing it so much that I listened to it again. I don't generally listen to episodes because I was there to start with. But I thought that Sensei Wilson and I really came up with some great stuff. And I'm curious, for those of you out there that have schools or, you know, are just observant, which of these things that we've talked about do you see being implemented? Which ones are working? Which ones aren't? More importantly, what did we miss? I would love to get some commentary going on the show notes page at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, episode 223, or you can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. You can find us on social media, at whistlekick, whatever works for you, because this is one of those subjects that I feel strongly, if we can share knowledge, we all benefit. Rising tide lifts all ships, and here we are. Let's raise some ships. No more punching holes and submarining. All right, that's all for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, have a great day.